to go over today. Uh, so see the list of announcements here. Um, so this week we'll be doing experiment 14 in lab. You'll have your last quiz, quiz number 11. Um, and your experiment 811, remember it's a combined report, is due this week. Um, next week, because of Thanksgiving week and we don't have lab on Thursday, we don't have organic lab next week, okay? Um, and so therefore there's no pre-lab lecture on Monday as well. Um, but we do have open lab Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So Monday is regular time, 9.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Tuesday, because we don't have regular lab, it'll be open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Wednesday from 9.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. because usually right before Thanksgiving there's not too many people hanging around to go to open lab on Wednesday. Um, and then next week at some point your experiment 12 report is due as well. So find out details from your lab process. In two weeks, when I see you again, um, that week in lab you'll be doing the data comparison for experiment 14, um, and we'll talk about that in lab lecture. You'll be checking out of your drawer, so make sure you bring your drawer key with you. Um, there'll be evaluations to be done in lab. And then experiment 14 on the syllabus is due two weeks from now, so see your prof, they'll have specifics about when it is due, okay? Big thing um, to remember, final exam is Friday, December 12th from 12.30 to 2.30 p.m. in here. So make sure everybody is in here on um, Friday, December 12th at that time to take the exam all together. Um, if you need special testing accommodations, sorry, I kind of fell off the bottom there. Um, so if you get special testing accommodations for lecture, you probably will want to see me for accommodations for lab the lab exam as well. Um, for those accommodations, I am the person who signs that paperwork, so you need to see me. So see me by two weeks from today. So the next time I see you again, make sure that you come see me to have me sign your, your paperwork for that, if that applies to you, okay? But um, the exam, um, if you take it in the Academic Support Center, the exam will still be given at that time, 12.30 to 2.30. Um, granted extra time or whatever, um, but it'll still be given that Friday afternoon. Okay, before we launch into experiment 14, there's a couple things I want to talk to you about experiment 8, or sorry, experiment 8, experiment 11, well, experiment 8 and 11. Um, so, GC, I had some questions about um, GC being a quantitative versus qualitative um, way to collect data. GC is very quantitative. You've got percentages um, reported back to you of percent alcohol, percent alkenes, all sorts of percentages um, in that GC data. So it is quantitative. And one of the things that you can get from it is purity. Okay? And so um, once you figure out how much, for example, experiment 8, once you figure out how much of experiment that experiment 8 sample is truly alcohol, you should use that purity information to go back and recalculate your yield, okay? So if you find out that like your experiment eight product was 96% alcohol, you should go back and multiply your yield by 0.96 because that's how much true yield you actually made, okay? Because when you take into account purity, how much of that sample is truly alcohol, it's going to be a smaller number than absolutely 100% of what you reported, okay? So Use your GC information for helping you figure out for the yield how much is truly alcohol or how much is truly alkenes for experiment 11, okay? Because it is a quantitative instrument, so you can figure out purity and therefore use the purity to go on and recalculate your yield. Um, so that was one announcement for experiment 8 and 11. The other one I have for experiment 12, kind of along the same line, I've had questions about with a TLC plate figuring out purity, okay? So remember, we were talking about RF values last week and they don't change. Um, you're not going to have an RF value change based on how pure the sample is. It's not like a melting point that will lower or raise because of the purity. So how do you tell if a sample is pure or not? What would you see in the TLC? So if you see one spot by TLC, that would be a pure sample, right? If you see more than one spot, then you would by TLC say that it isn't, it isn't pure, OK? 
Okay, so if you see one spot by TLC, so that's kind of saying that by under anything that's UV active, because we can only see things that are UV active by TLC, it looked like it was a pure compound. Okay, so keep those two things in mind. Um, how you figure out purity, and with TLC, that's going to be a qualitative measurement, not a quantitative measurement. Okay. So now we're going to look at Friedel Crafts alkylation, which is what we're going to do this week. Okay. And we're doing this without the background information that you would normally have in lecture. So we are going to talk about reactions with aromatic compounds, which so far you've been told basically aromatic rings, you're not going to do any re reaction on the aromatic rings. So this week we're going to show you a specific case that you can do that, okay? And usually in lecture they'll go through aromaticity and go through then all sorts of um, setup for going through this reaction, talk about effects across the aromatic ring and other similar types of reactions, but they haven't gotten there yet in lecture. So we're going to go through that with all without that background, okay? But to start with, what you need to understand is something that you, over the semester, have been kind of fed anyway. Aromatic rings don't typically react unless under certain special conditions. So this week we're going to do a reaction that represents one of those special conditions, okay? <coughs> and so what we need for this type of reaction is we're going to need a really good electrophile. So what we're going to use um, this, this type of reaction is electrophilic aromatic substitution. So what that means <coughs> is we're going to take an electrophile and it is going to substitute for one of the protons <coughs> on the aromatic ring. So we're going to have a reaction of an aromatic ring, an electrophile, um, to make a new compound in the end. Okay? And in general, um, so you need a really good electrophile to make this happen. Something else that you'll learn about is nucleophilic aromatic substitution. In that case, you need a really good nucleophile to make it happen. Okay? So we need a super good electrophile to make this happen. And you're still not going to, um, even with a really good electrophile, you're still not going to have something as reactive as reacting across a double bond, okay? So aromatic rings are not going to be as reactive as alkenes typically are, okay? And the main thing has to do with they want to stay that aromatic ring. They're really happy as that aromatic ring. So the general reaction that we're going to look at is an aromatic ring, and we're going to react with an alkyl bromide or alkyl halide, and we use a Lewis acid, okay? So it's kind of a little bit getting into organic metallic <coughs> chemistry because we're using something not organic as our Lewis acid to then get the substitution. So we're going to lose a proton here and get this alkyl group, that's why it's called an alkylation, to go on to the aromatic ring, okay? So in general, this is what we want to have happen, all right? So let me show you an example of that, okay? So, um, start here. Um, so first of all, in our case, in this example, and in our reaction that we're going to do in lab this week, our Lewis acid is aluminum chloride, okay? So that's going to be our Lewis acid. So in this case here, we've got two chloropropane. It first needs to react. We need to form our electrophile. We've got to get a really good electrophile formed before it can react in the aromatic ring. And that is what the Lewis acid is for, is to make that electrophile, okay? And so the Lewis acid, the aluminum chloride, will dechlorinate, dehalogenate our alkyl halide so that we get a good electrophile in that we have a carbocation that will react, okay? So this is very, definitely very electrophilic, um, having that full carbocation. And so what happens is there's kind of this transition state here where we've got the aluminum chloride reacting with this chlorine kind of, there's 
a point where there's a partial pull of the chlorine from the aluminum chloride and a partial pull for it to stay on the um, 2-chloropropane to, so to stay on the propane portion. But in the end, that aluminum chloride is able to pull that chlorine away. Okay. So now we've got our electrophile, our carbocation, and so we can take electron density from our aromatic ring. That is going to be donated to our um, carbocation. And so then what we form is this intermediate where we're going to have a positive charge on our aromatic ring, which in general, aromatic rings are not going to be happy with their aromaticity disrupted. So they like it just like this. They don't like to be like this. But we've got this electrophile that it wanted to react with. And there's even resonance structures that can be drawn of this intermediate. Okay, so here we've got still two double bonds on our six membered ring, and we have the positive charge on the ring. We can have resonance structures. So if we move this set of electrons, we could form this resonance structure. If we move this set of electrons, we can then, and this is positive charge on that carbon form this resonance structure. So there's three resonance structures that can be formed for this intermediate. So that helps a little bit with the stabilization of that intermediate because we have more than one resonance structure. Okay, And resonance structures will come into play being really important for the reaction that we're actually going to carry out, reactions we're going to use in lab this week. Okay, And so driving force to get to the final product is it really does want to be this aromatic ring wants to be aromatic again. So if lost its aromaticity, it wants to go back to being an aromatic ring. So we'll lose another proton and re-aromatize. And so then we get our um, isopropyl benzene, and then we get HCl from the reaction of ichlorine with this grabbing our proton here. We get the HCl, and then we get our aluminum chloride. Our Lewis acid is regenerated. And so in some texts, they will call this, and I believe McMurray does, calls this the actually a Lewis acid catalyst. Yes? I can say how in this case, how hydrogen chloride would be made. But how would hydrogen chloride be made if we were working with, is it isopropyl, or bromine, bromo isopropane? So then you're going to get HBr, right? Because you're going you're gonna to get kind of a mix of halogens there. And so, so you get HBr out that way. So then why are we doing the, uh, the class with the funnel? It's still acidic. HBr is acidic just like HCl. Okay. And so you're just trapping that. Okay. So yeah, I'll get to that here in a little bit. Cool. But same idea. Whether it's um, alkyl bromide or alkyl chloride, you're still going to form some form of an acid component now in the end, and you need to trap that. Okay? okay? All right. So everybody good so far? Okay, so now we're going to look at our specific reaction. So keep this in mind. But now what we're going to do is we're going to add a substituent to our aromatic ring. And we'll talk about why that is here in a little bit. So we're actually going to take the solvent toluene. And so this, the toluene will be our solvent. It will also be our aromatic reactant. Two roles in this reaction, solvent and reactant. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at actually two alkyl halides. Okay? So we're going to, so it's kind of been previewed here a little bit. Our alkyl halides are going to be bromides, not chlorides. So we're going to look at one bromopropane, and we're going to look at what happens when you react two bromopropane. Now, something else that you're going to learn when you're learning about aromatic rings is there's some nomenclature that you need to learn for the substitution that happens. Okay? And so, since we already have a substituent on our aromatic ring, we have the methyl group from our toluene. Okay? Now we're going to add one of these guys on. And so, when we talk about something being added on the ring, opposite or in conjunction with a substituent we already have, 
He used the terminology ortho, para, and meta, and that has to do with what type of substitution you have on the aromatic ring. Okay? And so, first compound we could form is this is ortho substitution. And so, this is the 1, 2, 1, 2 substitution. Okay? We could add on the ring what is called para to that methyl group. And so that's going to be 1, 4, so 1, 2, 3, 4 substitution is going to be para substitution. And then the last possibility is adding here, which is meta or 1, 3. And so when you're looking at the rings, you've got two ortho positions, right? You could be one, two here, or you could be one, two here. You've got two meta positions, one, two, three here, or one, two, three here. But you only have one para position. Okay? And that's just part of dealing with aromatic rings. Okay? So that's what happens if one bromopropane were to add. If we look at the same type of reaction with the 2-bromopropane, then the substituents we would have would look like this. So we would have, again, our toluene. If we added ortho, then this time, adding the 2-bromopropane, that's what it would look like. When we add para, that's what it would look like. And then meta. <coughs> that would be the meta substituent. And again, with ortho and meta, we could say that this is, instead of having it there, we could have it here. Or with the ortho, instead of having it here, we could have it here. And it would still be ortho substitution. Okay? So everybody good there so far? Okay. So this week in lab, we will be doing this reaction, and we're going to divvy up the who does what. Um, so some people will be using um, one bromyl propane. Some people will be using two bromyl propane. Okay? And we're going to look at, by GC, the product distribution of what you get. Okay? But now... We're going to throw in one more wrinkle to the whole thing, okay? So um, the carbocation that we can form with the rom one bromo propane looks like this. The carbocation we form with our two bromo propane looks like that, okay? So in this very, in the very first step, when it's reacting with the aluminum chloride, the carbocation that is initially formed in that reaction. Okay? So we could say here that we've got, for this reaction, we've got aluminum chloride involved. Um, now, which of these two is going to be more stable? The second one, right? And so what we will actually see is the carbocation that is formed from the one bromopropane can rearrange and form the secondary carbocation. Okay. And so if that happens, Again, when we're looking at reactions with just the one bromopropane, propane. So again, we can form our propyl products.
free propyl pot products, ortho, para, meta. But if we get, so that would all come from this carbocation, okay? If it rearranges, then we could have that carbocation. So then, we can add the isopropyl products as well. of one bromopropane with toluene, there's actually six possibilities for products, okay? In the reaction of two bromopropane <coughs> with toluene, we've got three possibilities for products, okay? Does everybody see that? Okay, so far? So we're going to look at product distribution, and in the case of the one bromopropane, we're also looking at what carbocation is reacting, what's going on with the carbocation that's reacting. Okay. Now, in this, we're going to look at, with our product distribution, there's kinetic and thermodynamic effects. Okay. And so there's kinetic products and thermodynamic products. Okay. And we're using the toluene, instead of just using benzene itself, partially because it's not really great to use benzene in lab, um, and so it's better to use toluene, toluene, but it's also, that methyl group is also important on the toluene, okay? Um, it is what is called an ortho-para activator, and so in all that information that they're going to show you in lecture to get you all ready for this reaction, but we've already previewed it, you're going to talk about this table. So this table is out of McMurray, okay? You're going to talk about all parts of this table, okay? The part that we're looking at here is this ortho-para directing activators and the fact that a methyl group is there, okay? And so it is there because it actually can help stabilize your intermediate and what is formed because it's got a little bit of electron density that it can contribute to the intermediate to help stabilize the situation, okay? And um, it's not like it'll donate an electron, like it's, we're talking electron density, so we're talking an inductive effect, kind of similar to how you've got, um, you know, secondary carbocations more stabilized than a, a primary carbocation, same idea, okay? Um, so, when you go back in lecture looking at all these tables, this one is the one that's key to what we're doing this week, okay? The ortho-para um, directing activators. And I'm not going to go through, in lecture, they'll go through all of these pieces and looking at how all these pieces come into play with reactions with the aromatic rates, okay? What I want to show you, so we already looked at um, resonant structures when we were just looking at benzene and the reaction of chloro, um, chloropropane. What we're going to look at now, so here is our reaction, okay? We've got, um, and this can be, this is a reaction, the way it's shown, it's shown with two um, bromopropane or the secondary carbocation, but it works the same way with the, with the propyl group as well, okay? So we've got toluene reacting with either one or two bromo, the ca carbocation formed from one or two bromopropane, okay? So either a primary carbocation or a secondary carbocation. So now we're going to look at if, if that group adds ortho or in the meta position or in the para position, these are the three resonance structures for each of those substitutions that's going to form. And so, if we add in the ortho position, this is what intermediate we get immediately. We can also f have this resonance structure that is formed from the movement of electrons. 
this resonance structure can also form from the movement of electrons. What is key with these resonance structures is with the ortho substitution, one of the resonance structures, you end up with a carbocation on the carbon where that methyl group is attached. Okay, and we already said that that methyl group can contribute a little bit of air, uh, a little bit of electron density to that aromatic ring. By it doing that, it's going to help stabilize that carbocation. And so, if you look at in this case, this just looks like a tertiary carbocation, right? But it's going to be happier here than it would be in this position or this position, where you've got two secondary carbocations. Okay. So ortho position, we've got a resonance structure where a positive charge is on the carbon with um, that methyl group. The meta substitution, when you add meta, you don't get a resonance structure where you get that positive charge on that same carbon. Okay. When you add para, you do. All right. So here we've got para substitution. We go through the resonance structures. Here we've got this resonance structure where that positive charge is on that carbon where that methyl group is. So we've got more stabilization here from that methyl group. Okay. So when that intermediate is more stabilized, there's going to be a lower energy energy barrier to getting that type of substitution than go on, going on and getting that um, final product. So when it's easier for something to form immediately because of effects like this, what type of product is that going to be? Mm -hmm. The kinetic products for this experiment will be the ortho and para, what we consider kinetic, okay? At least immediately by just looking at resonance structures, these we, we would label as the kinetic products, ortho and para. The meta product doesn't have that um, stabilization, but that doesn't mean that it wouldn't form. So based on looking at these resonance structures, we would say then the meta is going to be the thermodynamically favored product, just looking at this, okay? So for right now, um, based on what I just showed you, these guys would be our kinetic, kinetic, these would be our thermodynamic properties, okay? Now, to actually truly figure that out and figure out what's formed under thermal conditions and what's formed under kinetic conditions, we're going to do the experiment. So that's part of what we're going to be looking at in the experiment is that product distribution, okay? So we're going to look at what products are formed under different conditions and when we have one bromopropane versus two bromopropane, what carbocation is reacting? Okay, so we're going to look at carbocation reacting products that are formed. Okay, everyone good with that so far? Okay, and we're going to use GC data to do this. All right, so um, put up here. I'm going to show you the apparatus as I kind of, and I'll go through describing it. But first I'm going to show you the reaction conditions, okay? So just kind of keep this guy in mind as we're talking about the different reaction conditions, all right? And I'm going through the conditions that are labeled in your um, lab manual, the way they're labeled. So we want to make sure we're talking about the same thing, okay? So there's four sets of conditions labeled A, B, C, and D, okay? So under conditions A, we're going to run this reaction at zero degrees, okay? So that means an ice bath. So our reaction will be sitting in an ice bath. And for conditions A, we're going to use one bromopropane, okay? So based on what we just talked about, what possible products could we be looking at under those conditions? Of those guys up there. Oh. So we're top one, top two. The top three and and the bottom three, right? Because if that carbon 
So remember, one bromopropane can have its carbocation rearranged to the secondary carbocation, and so you can form propyl products and isopropyl products. Does everybody see that? Okay, so from this reaction, you potentially could see propyl, propyl group on there, and it's going to be ortho, para, or meta, or you could see then the isopropyl substitution, so let's do it like this, which is going to be ortho, para, or meta substitution. So those are just possibilities for what could happen, okay? Those are, those are the possible products you could see based on that combination of using the one bromopropane, okay? <coughs> for B conditions, we're going to do this at reflux, and we're still going to use one bromopropane. So again, what products would be possible? Same, same possibility, okay? That's not saying that you're going to get all of them, but all of these are possible. The next conditions are zero degrees, and we're going to use the two bromopropane. Okay, so what um, products would be possible that way? Just these guys, right? Because your carbocation won't go backwards, most likely. It's just going to stick to these guys. Then D is reflux, again, 2-bromopropane, and so again, we should have just these products possible, okay? Everybody good with that? Okay, so this is what we're going to analyze with the GC data. Right, you're going to look at your product distribution. So this time when you get GC data um, and the standards, you'll have a retention time for toluene, and then you'll have retention times for orthopara meta propyl toluene and orthopara meta isopropyl toluene. So you have seven retention times that you're going to be using. Okay. Um, you've got to be careful to kind of watch Look at the retention times when you're assessing this, and then look at your data and look at what makes sense. Because what happens is these um, compounds come off the GC so close together that their retention times and the error bars on their retention times kind of overlap. So you've got to think about what's going to make sense, okay? So if you've got um, zero degrees and two bromopropane, if there's some overlap of the isopropyl products with propyl products, you're probably not going to have really a lot of propyl products in your reaction mixture. You're probably going to have mainly isopropyl, okay? So it makes, you kind of have to use a little bit of reasoning too in looking at the GC data to what makes sense, all right? But again, you'll have standard retention times to use to evaluate your data. So this week in lab, you're going to make a GC sample and you're going to, um, and not a GC mass spec sample, it'll be a GC sample, and then you're going to get your data, and then in some form, you're also going to get can, uh, other people's data, okay? So one person will do reaction A, other people in the group will do B, C, and D, okay? So each person's going to have one set of conditions, okay? So one group data will be four people would have contributed to that data. Does everybody see that part? Okay, and so somehow, um, and each prop, lab prop has kind of a different way of doing it, somehow you will share data once you get the GC data, okay? Whether it's a Google Doc or actual physical data, how you share it, you're going to share it within that group, okay? And in lab this week, we will assign to you your reaction conditions, what reaction conditions you are going to use for your experiment. So for the pre-lab, make sure you pre-lab all of the possible conditions, okay? And really, it's a matter of this table 
and showing all the possible conditions, and then in the end, the physical data table, it's you know you're going to list two alkyl bromides instead of just one, right? For your GC sample, what's really important is there's going to be a new part of it that I want you to add on, and that helps me when I'm running the samples and figuring out what's going on um, and making this list of standard retention times. So you want to give your initials and your notebook page, and then the reaction conditions letter, okay? So your information this week should end in a letter. So initials, notebook page, reaction conditions letter, just like this, okay? No P in here for page number or experiment A or anything like this. Just give me initials, notebook page, letter, all right? But make sure you do include your letter, okay? So when we get your data, we can make sure it does make sense for what you, what <coughs> reactions you actually, re what reaction you actually ran, all right? Two weeks from now, we're going to go through the data analysis. I'm going to go through the example data analysis um, at lab lecture. So the first half of lab lecture, two weeks from now, I'm going to go through the data analysis. And that's on page 14-9 and 14-10. Um, so you want to start working, once you get your data back, start working through that analysis. So then when I go through it, Hopefully that will help you be able to put your data together because when you come to lab two weeks from now on Tuesday and Thursday in lab, you're going to need that, that data all put together um, and all of those tables figured out, okay? And potentially before you even come to lab, you're going to need to su submit that information, okay? So we'll go through, there's four separate tables you're going to put together. We'll go through that in lab lecture example, but before lab lecture, use your data and try and go through it as well as the data you get from the other conditions, okay? All right, so the apparatus that you're going to use this week is going to look like this. So we're not, no round bottom flask this week. We're gonna use an Erlenmeyer flask for our reaction. And um, you're gonna have a servar in here. You're going to have it on um, a hot plate, okay? If you are doing the reaction at zero degrees, you're also going to start with it in an ice bath. All right, it will start from the get-go in an ice bath. If you're going to do the reaction at reflux, it'll actually start at room temperature. You won't have any heat on the hot plate yet. Um, you'll eventually add heat, okay? So you're gonna clamp your um, Erlenmeyer flask. You'll have a rubber stopper on top. You're going to connect it to some black tubing from your common equipment drawer. What is really important is you need to make sure that black tubing is really dried out. You don't want any gunk or water, anything like that in that tubing. You need to make sure that it's as dried out as possible um, to make sure all the water's dried out and make sure any other liquid that's in there is dried out. Now be careful, you don't wanna be like shaking it around when you're doing this, especially if you're beyond the first lab for um, this week. So if you're not in Tuesday morning's lab, be careful shaking the hoses because if it was used in the previous experiment, there may be some reaction mixture or vapor left in the hose and you don't wanna be shaking that around, okay? Because it potentially could be acidic from our Lewis acid. So we've got a 250 milliliter um, filtering flask, got it clamped, stopper, we're going to set it up with our rubber tubing connected to it. You wanna actually put a little bit of a dip in the tubing, that's kind of the last catch that if you've got um, gunk that goes into the tubing, it doesn't come back out into your reaction, because if it does, it'll add tons of peaks to your GC analysis. So you don't want any backflow of stuff from that tubing. Then you're gonna clamp here to hold the tubing up. Then you're going to clamp here on your f um, stemmed funnel. You want that funnel to sit one, one millimeter down into the water, so hardly in any amount of water at all, not very far down in there, in this beaker of water. The reason for this part is this is your acid trap, so we need to tra trap the acid that's generated um, so that we're not just bubbling off acid. So as it bubbles, it should, you'll still see bubbling, but it should be that the acid ends up trapped in that water, and then you'll just see the release of pressure as it bubbles, okay? So be careful when you disassemble this because all of a sudden you've made this acidic instead of just neutral water, okay? 
but you need to trap that acid that is made. So the other thing is when you're setting this up, put that acid trap towards the back of the hood so that that helps with any other acid that's given off that's not trapped in the trap. It's at the back of the hood, not the front of the hood where you are, okay? Now you're going to um, start either with an ice bath if you're at zero degrees or at room temperature if you're um, at reflux. And during that time, you're going to um, be adding the acid chloride or aluminum chloride in, um, in portions to your reaction mixture. Okay, so your lab manual tells you how many portions. You want to make sure you have good stirring. So if you're in an ice bath, that whole time during the uh, aluminum chloride addition and the reaction time afterwards, you're in an ice bath. For the reflux conditions, you're going to be at room temperature for the aluminum chloride addition. Once you've got that all stirred in, then you're going to start refluxing it, okay? And what you've got to be careful of is this is our condenser, okay? So you don't want any vapor to go beyond this area of your flask because if it goes into the tubing, that's what makes the gunk that could come back out into your flask. So you can put a wet paper towel here, but be really careful with the heating, very gentle, like setting of one on your hot plate, really low setting for that reflux time. You don't want it too hot. And you may even have to turn it off and turn it back on. But you don't want any vapor generation beyond this area of your flask. All right? Otherwise, potential for gunk coming back into your reaction. Um, so that's the, for the reflux, heat it very gently, okay? Then in both cases, once you're done with the reaction time, you'll cool it down, go through the workup procedure. Be careful, part of the workup, you're using concentrated HCl. Make sure you wear gloves with that. Um, also with the aluminum chloride, be really careful with it. So it generates HCl. We've seen that in um, the reaction that I showed you earlier. You're also going to be generating HBr. But aluminum chloride itself reacts with water to generate HCl as well. So that means um, you don't want to inhale it because if you get any in your nose, it'll um, react with the mucous membranes of your nose. It'll react with the mucous membranes in your eyes, okay? So keep it in the hood. Keep a barrier between you and it and make sure, be careful with the dust, that your hood is always down when you're adding the aluminum chloride. We've made it a little bit easier for you handling it. It's already going to be in pre-weighed vials, okay? So you're going to get a vial of aluminum chloride, weigh everything. Go through adding all of the aluminum chloride to your reaction, get the weight of the cap in the vial at the end, so then you can figure out how much aluminum chloride was, react was added to your reaction mixture. Okay, so get vial cap aluminum chloride mass before, get vial cap mass afterwards, then you can figure out how much aluminum chloride was added. Okay? But in the meantime, always keep it in the hood, wear gloves with it, don't let any of that dust just be floating around in the air because it instantly forms HCl and it's very irritating. When you're done with that vial and you've got the masses that you need, you can carefully, in your hood, submerge it in a beaker of water. That'll kill the rest of the residual aluminum chloride. It'll probably fizzle at you a little bit. Um, make sure all that aluminum chloride is um, killed before you then rinse it out really well with water, rinse it out with acetone, and then you can return the vial to a regular vial box. Okay. So be careful handling the aluminum chloride because it it does very easily react with moisture. Also, keep it capped when you're not using it so it's not reacting with the moisture in the air, killing your aluminum chloride before you put it in your reaction. Okay. Um, so a couple things also to for um, notes for the rest of the procedure. So you're going to go through the um, workup um, you do an acid workup. One of the possibilities of what can form in that workup is what's called an emulsion. And so you're doing this workup. You're going to have two layers in your secretory funnel. What could form is this emulsion layer. Okay? And so what that is is like a layer stuck in between your aqueous and organic layer. It looks like you have a third layer in there. And what it is is just this combining of the aqueous and organic, and they don't want to pull apart from each other. They just want to stick together. So what you will use to help you with that is we have sodium chloride solution. 
And so follow, there's instructions in your lab manual, follow those instructions for adding the sodium chloride solution. If you get an emulsion with the um, workup, don't, once you add the sodium chloride, don't shake it really hard because that usually makes emulsions worse instead of better. Just use the sodium chloride to kind of help pull the two layers apart. So by adding the sodium chloride, it's saturated with the salt, okay? So we're trying to make that aqueous layer by adding it to your separatory funnel, this is gonna go into the aqueous layer. We're trying to make that aqueous layer as undesirable as possible for that organic layer so that emulsion can separate out and the organic will go with organic and aqueous will go with aqueous, okay? But what you don't wanna do is really shake that separatory funnel because it'll just make that emulsion layer probably even bigger instead of things to separate out. Things will get more confused in their separation instead of figuring things out, okay? So be careful with the formation of the emulsion layer. And like I said, if you get an emulsion, then follow the instructions for um, breaking it apart. If you get an emulsion, one of the things you're going to do after you separate the two layers is wash with water. Instead of washing with water, wash with sodium chloride, because if you've made an emulsion once, you're probably gonna make it again, all right? You're going to dry with magnesium sulfate like you have in the past. Okay, so again, only add what you need to have clumping and a little bit of free flowing. Filter by gravity. Now what you don't want to do is um, you don't want to rinse your filtrate with anything. And don't, or you don't want to rinse that magnesium sulfate with anything, okay? Because part of what we're looking at is product distribution. And part of what we're looking at is how much toluene is left. If you add more toluene, that's going to disrupt your product distribution of reactant and product um, in, from your reaction, okay? So you don't want to rinse with toluene, okay? So you're going to dry with magnesium sulfate, filter, don't rinse with anything, all right? Then you're going to get the mass of that reaction mixture. So what you filter into, know the weight. Um, so then you can, once you add the filtrate to it, you can figure out the mass of that reaction mixture. All right? Get that mass. Then you're going to make your GC sample. And remember, you don't want any solids and no water in that GC sample. Um, follow the instructions on page 14-8 for the GC sample prep. You're using pentane as your solvent again. Make sure no solids, no water in there, okay? Then your lab manual talks about going on and doing a distillation, a fractional distillation. You're not going to do that last distillation, okay? So once you've got the mass of your reaction mixture, you've prepared your GC sample, you don't need to do that last distillation, but what you do need to do, and so this kind of ties into what I was talking about earlier with GC and quantitative results, you're going to use your GC data to figure out how much of this mass is truly product, okay? So once you get your GC data, go back and use the percentage of the mass, or sorry, percentage product to figure out how much of this mass was truly product. So like if you go back and calculate, you've got alkylated product that's like 33% of the mixture, you go back and multiply 0.33 times this mass, that's how much product you have in that total mass of everything, okay? So that, then we don't do that last distillation, which would disrupt your product distribution because you're heating something when you want to figure out what happens kinetically and thermodynamically, it doesn't really help to then add heat to the situation. So you don't want to do that, but you do need this mass, and then go back and use your GC data to figure out how much of that mass was product. Okay, okay. I'm going to give you guys um, a couple numbers here, and then um, I want to give you a couple words about the um, practice exam that I handed out to you too. Okay, so to help you with your pre-lab, here's some information for your pre-lab. Bromopropane has a molecular weight of 123 grams per mole. Its density 
is equal to 1.353 grams per milliliter and its boiling point is 71 degrees Celsius. Okay, so that will help you with your pre-lab. So it kind of takes care of having to write a pre-lab for both of these guys. Um, two bromopropane molecular weight is going to be the same because they're positional isomers. Density is 1.31 grams per milliliter. And the boiling point is 59.4 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, now, in what I've covered today with the Frieda Krauts alkylation reaction, when you cover it in lecture, go back and look at all this information because you're going to need to put the two of them together for figuring out this data analysis, okay? So remember to revisit all this again once you go through it in lecture. Um, as far as the practice exam, so I put practice final exams in the back of, um, at the top of the stairs. Make sure you get one when you leave. Go through it over the next couple weeks. When I see you again, we're going to go through an example for the data analysis, and we're going to go through the practice exam um, for, for that final exam. So go through it beforehand so you know what you know and you know what you don't know. Instead of going through it with me and going, oh yeah, that's all familiar, and then you get to the exam and it, it wasn't all familiar, okay? So that's your additional homework is going through that exam.